these drugs are good, women should be able to take them, freedom of choice, don't let people suppress you kind of attitude. When they do that, they're, they're not actually thinking about the implications of their words. They're thinking about followers, not implications of what their words are actually saying. And that's scary. I wanted to circle back to something you mentioned earlier about not having the data, but anecdotally noticing a lot more women, particularly young yeah. going down the performance enhancing drugs route. I was hoping you could shine a little bit of a light on why you think that is. Why are more women turning to performance enhancing drugs? Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, it's, I can tell you that, so I started training in the gym in about 2004, 2005. And back then, weight training, muscle building was not something you saw young women do, um, or women of any age do. There was kind of this delineated line in the gym of you had the women doing cardio, doing their aerobic classes, and then you had men in the weight room like it was such a delineated there may be that one off kind of fitness competitor or lifelong athlete that still kind of trained in that sense but in like the the everyday gym world you just didn't see that fast forward to today <laughs> we have such a beautiful revolution happening where women are going into the gym where women are wanting to intentionally build muscle through the rigors of nutrition and lifestyle and weight training and get as strong as they can and not just for physique purposes but also for health purposes we know muscle is the you know the organ of longevity as my my good friend and colleague dr gabrielle line says right it's got an incredibly important physiological purpose in our bodies and so why wouldn't we want to be able to do activities that support that now, because of ideas around sex and gender and kind of just like that biologicalness of being a female, there was always that kind of idea that having muscle was was not okay for women to possess, you know, and that that is a social construction. It's not rooted in biology but at all. Um, and so that, I would say, shifted a ton in the last, especially 10 years, 20 years, but especially last the 10 years or so, um, in which you do see women being like taking back that taking back that idea that I can be strong, I can be muscular, I can, you know, train hard and eat well, and really honing the idea of being a athletic female, no matter what their walk of life is. Um, we just didn't see that 20 years ago the same. I think with that comes also this desire to get there faster to the use of drugs. Um, I think there's also that idea that uh, and I talked about this kind of at a talk a couple months ago, but education has lagged far behind what we're seeing users and, and kind of practice doing. So in the world of sport medicine, uh, exercise physiology, but then also conversations around health and performance within kind of more of the professional or practical sector that, that's lagged behind. Education is just lagged behind. And so you have individuals that are doing things that we don't have science to support. Um, and it's not that we haven't tried. It's just that we're, it's outpaced. It's, it's completely outpaced by users. Um, and I would argue with the, the drug use, it's the same thing. I think social media is a big factor too. I think there is this wild thing of unrealistic beauty standards that when I grew up in the nineties, you know, it was the world of photoshopping and magazines. And now it's photoshopping everyday people through the use of apps. Um, beauty standards have also changed. Um, you know, oddly enough, I think we actually have made the Kardashians to think for this, but like the idea that it was about big booties, like the big booty era of like 2014 moving forward. So women were going into the gym to try to get this very kind of over the top lower body. Um, and so that, that beauty standard has shifted. It may shift back. I said to my husband that I, everything, I know everything goes around. So we're probably going to go back into the ultra skinny. I'm just waiting for that day to happen. And then we're probably going to have more conversations around eating disorders and low nutrition and the um, overuse of certain stimulants or agents to help with kind of big air quotes, but fat loss. Um, that stuff is always moving. So it's just going to be a matter of time until we see the pendulum swing again. So the primary driver, again, anecdotally that you're seeing is, is women want to get, get not only stronger, but actually yeah. want 
put on lean muscle mass that that's that's yeah. your experience like again yeah. I find that so fascinating for a number of reasons, but I think the education is what I want to focus on because for a, for a young guy going in and supplementing their testosterone or whatever, they're going to see the results. And maybe if they're yeah. relatively sensible, there's not going to be a ton of long-term negative implications. But my concern would be for women not having the education behind it is it would be very easy to suddenly be taking on too much of these compounds could that then can have not only severe health implications, but potentially irreversible ones as well. Is there is there an education piece missing here? Are you worried about these children? Oh, yeah, in, absolutely. And, and taking it and then not realizing what they're, yeah, they yeah. might have gotten some muscle in the first three months, but what are they going to look like in, in three years? Yeah, and I see this a lot. Um, so in 2016, um, I got the opportunity to speak at a big sport medicine conference, a really big one. And it was really... The, I would say one of the first times that a female stood up, female academic stood up and was like, hey, we need to start talking about this. Because I saw it, I saw it starting. Um, you know, I was, I was training every day in a commercial gym in like a residential area and I was seeing more women use starting. And it was an incredibly important conversation that we had back then that I kind of started and I just have been continuing to have it because I think it is, we don't have the education. There is this huge kind of binary that we create in terms of these are the worst things ever. Women should never take them or they're not that big of a deal. Not, not a problem. And it's just way more complicated than that. Like I said, we have to talk more about what their health status is before using. We have to talk about their age. We have to look at their reproductive history, their health history, their duration of use. Like there are so many nuances and involved that just are completely getting lost in this good versus bad kind of dichotomy that's created. Um, I'm more scared today than I was a decade ago around female use, even with more educators going out and speaking to this, it's not enough. Um, there's always going to be a proliferation because more and more young women are doing yeah. it. So your yeah. Concern. yeah. So my concern, like more women are using, we don't have education within the medical sector about it. Um, we don't have education within the kind of more wellness fitness sector about it. What we do have, I see a lot. I try not to pay attention to it because I'm, I like to see what people are saying, but I get so frustrated when I see sometimes some of the ideas promoted and then I just go, okay, that just means I got to put my head down and work harder to get the better understanding, the better words out there. But the idea that it's okay for young girls to take, let's say testosterone replacement therapy, that's not benign. Even if it's testosterone, which our bodies make, so the molecule of testosterone and let's say an injectable ester, certain types is going to look similar to what our bodies make. But at 22, who already has, um, let's say, abnormal menstrual cycles, is already on an oral contraceptive agent that's having an anti-androgenic effect, because some of the oral contraceptives do it, if they take that, is it is it okay? I don't have the data, but I can tell you from like, the biochemical world and the physiological world, probably not. But unfortunately, you have promoters and individuals saying that it is okay. And that's what scares me because there are people in powerful positions that have hundreds of thousands of followers on social media that are going like, no, no, it's fine. It's biological. It's okay. And, you know, a little goes a long way. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's way more complicated than that. Um, the human body, whether we're talking about men or women, is incredibly complex interdynamic network of molecules and systems past and present and that in the female reproductive system hormones are always changing right we have our ovarian hormone production it is an incredibly complex physiological cascade that occurs and it is very sensitive to the use of certain um, biochemicals or the certain kind of injection of, of um, drugs into the the system whether we're talking about thyroid hormone when it's not needed, whether we're talking about androgens when it's not needed, whether we're talking about kind of the stacking of multiple different things when it, it's not needed. And I'm not saying that women shouldn't do that, but they need to ask questions about it. They need to really think about what is being promoted, why it's being promoted and by who. They need to think about what's involved for them to be able to potentially do this safer or healthier if that's the direction that they want to go. They need to really kind of dial in and go, do I have my foundations in place first? Like, does using this substance make sense for me today? If I'm a 22-year-old female that just started lifting, I don't have 
my nutrition on point. I'm not sleeping. I'm still drinking alcohol. I'm on a hormonal contraceptive that's have high amounts of synthetic estradiol or so ethanol estradiol and an anti-androgenic progesterone. Does that make sense then to throw an anabolic steroid in the mix? Probably not. I can't say. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm just amazed because just again, my, my, perhaps my naivety thinking that a 22 year old young woman would be considering this kind of, yeah. again, I'm not in that particular world on social media. I'm not following those type of accounts. So, but the information is out there, Victoria. It doesn't take long to, to, to go to a search engine and find out what the side effects were. So is this, is this young woman, is this young, well, I'll, I'll let, I'll let you ask, <laughs> I'll finish my question in case it helps you yeah. out. Is this young woman ignoring? the information out there thinking, well, I trust this influencer more, or is it genuine that they don't understand what they're doing? Because I think there's quite an important distinction there, which would be more encouraging to you putting information out there if you felt that it was just a vacuum gap. But if it's women choosing to ignore the warnings because the short-term gains are more attractive to them, that's a completely different battle, isn't it? Yeah. So I think it's a few different things happening here. So, okay. (laughs) Let me take a breath here. So, can't say this is everybody, but this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing certain downplaying of potential physiological implications of use. So I don't call, let's say, hair growth, facial hair growth or acne. I don't call those side effects of androgens. I call them effects. They're unintended effects. You just want the muscle building potential. You don't want all the other baggage that comes with it. You don't want, you know, micro or chronic inflammation. You don't want an obligatory menstrual cycle. You don't want that, but let me tell you, if depending on the user, the duration of the use, the drug being used, that can happen. They're not the intended ones you want. And so high levels of androgens in many individuals are not benign, whether we're talking about men or women, that they have to be monitored. And unfortunately, there's this kind of discussion that I see in the fitness industry right now, where there's this downplaying of risk, because, you know, the, the risks have been hyperinflated. That's the thing is that they're, especially with like anabolics, like they've been so hyperinflated by the, the politic kind of community, the scientific community, the medical community, that you have this like absolute opposite effect happening where it's like, don't listen to them. It's wrong. If you Google them, they're not telling you the truth. They're suppressing you. They are keeping you down and not letting you be optimal. And it's like, whoa, (laughs) not quite. Neither of the people, neither of the camps are really, you know, thinking through this carefully and critically. Um, so that's number one thing I see is I see experts that are kind of promoting this idea that risks are hyperinflated. Number two is I see experts that are taking um, discussions of certain pharmaceutical androgens and putting them not in context. So they're looking at a specific study, let's say that's been done on individuals that are transitioning. So uh, F to M or within um, geriatric populations, chronically ill populations, but women and, and applying those results to your 22 year olds and being like, well, this is what this study found. And it's just like, no, it's way more complicated than that. Um, so I see that happening. Uh, so they kind of have this guise of science behind them that this is what the, the research is saying. And the reality is, is that, yeah, the research is saying that, but it's not for that population. It's not for that drug. Um, so I'm seeing kind of these over inflation of scientific studies that may not be totally backed by um, solid time-tested empirical data. Um, And then I'm seeing individuals that are going to certain types of, like if I were just to Google, let's say like female steroid cycle, uh, they're going to some of the websites that pop up without recognizing that who's making this information are the people manufacturing the drugs. And so now you're getting this like really grossly made information that's not necessarily a, I don't want to say accurate portrayal, but maybe a fully encompassing portrayal of how these drugs are going to interact with you. And just like many uses of drugs, whether they're talking about pharmaceutical or lifestyle recreational, is that people don't put it in context. So the conversation about like, how does this information apply to me? You know, is there more risks for a 22-year-old than there is for a 35-year-old? Is there more risks for somebody who is on other types of medications or that have certain types of health histories or that have certain types of future health goals? Let's say they want to be able to conceive in the next three to five years. Um, there, There's that, that piece of actually thinking through use that's not happening. 
Um, and then I also see the, 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 and then I can't big air quotes, but experts in this field that are kind of looking at this in this very limited myopic way of going like, these drugs are good. Women should be able to take them freedom of choice. Don't let people suppress you kind of attitude when they do that. They're, they're not actually thinking about the implications of their words. They're thinking about followers, not implications of what their words are actually saying. And that's scary. That is a really scary thing. As, a, as somebody who prides themselves in doing really solid research that's not only theoretical, but empirical based, it is scary to see that happening um, because the platform is given often to those who have the biggest following, not who should have the biggest following. And I think in this conversation, that's what I see.